Okay. Welcome, everyone, friends, militants, family, um, to the uh, second KU Leuven teach-in um, in the series Palestine Inside Out, organized by KUL for Palestine and the Department of Social and Cultural uh, Anthropology and uh, led by uh, Nadia Fadil. Um, the title of <laughs> uh, the title of the uh, teaching today is Unveiling Boundaries, Understanding Spatial Dynamics in Apartheid Architecture and Settler Colonialism. Now, apartheid, as we all know too well, is not only a matter of deep inequality in access to economic resources, social mobility, basic rights, and indeed citizenship. It is also a question of infrastructures, of building physical boundaries, segmenting space, and policing place. It involves not only symbolic, but also structural, as well as physical uh, violence. It ruins life worlds and undermines future imaginings. But equally important is the fact that it is resisted. It is subverted and it is encountering world-building ventures. These and other related issues is what we are going to explore and look into tonight with the help of three contributors whom I have the privilege of introducing to you. The first speaker is Hilde Heinen, who is here present. She is Professor of Architectural Theory at the University of Leuven. Her research focuses on modernity, modernism, and gender in architecture. Hilde Heinen will provide an introduction to the theme of this teaching with a short lecture under the title The Israel Palestine uh, or Israel Palestine from a Spatial Perspective. She will provide some background on the Zionist colonial project in Palestine from a historical and spatial perspective. That will be a kind of a short lecture of 10 minutes, just reminding. The second speaker is Nurhan Abujidi. She is associate professor of, at Zuid University of Applied Sciences in Maastricht, where she is also head of the uh, Smart Urban Redesign Research Center. She did her PhD on colonial urbanism and architecture of resistance. Am I still not lying? In her lecture, Nurhan Abujidi will focus on political ecologies and violence discourse. She will address herbicide and genocide and how these are reflected in Nablu city and Gaza. She also looks into Palestinian resistance discourses and practices, as well as the role of academia in emancipation and empowerment under these conditions. And finally, the third speaker is Alessandra Gola, who's joining us online from the West Bank. She's an architect. She defended her PhD in architecture at the KU Leuven uh, this, earlier this year. And her supervisor, or one of her supervisors, was Hilde Heinen, together with Professor Rema uh, Hamami from Birzeit uh, University. And the PhD was entitled Socio-Spatial Practices in Contemporary Urban Palestine, a Probe into the Everyday. Alessandra Gola is co-founder also of the Yala Project, an independent and self-sustained applied research hub based in Nablus uh, and Brussels. Alessandra Gola um, will be uh, presenting a recorded lecture, or uh, you will be sharing your screen, we'll just see how that uh, goes, but she will further elaborate on the role of academia in uh, decolonizing endeavors, while also explaining the kind of resistance the YALA project is trying to bring about, highlighting not only the methodology they are developing, but also its impact on empowering the local community. So welcome to our three speakers. Um, I will immediately give the floor to Hilde Heinen. 
after the three uh, interventions, there will be uh, ample time for questions from the room. And I'm uh, <coughs> warning the online followers that there will be no possibility to uh, ask questions. Sorry about that, but it's a bit too complicated in these already very complicated times. Hilde Heinen, please. Okay, good evening uh, to you all. Uh, to make the most of my allotted uh, 10 minutes, I immediately start with uh, uh, telling you what um, I'm going uh, to speak about. I'll give a very brief overview of the research at the Department of Architecture at this university, since that is the home of uh, um, the research that is presented to you tonight. Uh, I will give a, big of a bit of background that many of you familiar with the situation in Palestine will already know, uh, but still I think it's useful to uh, repeat it. Uh, history of displacement, settler colonialism, uh, are other headings. So this is uh, a line of research developed at the Department of Architecture. I cannot myself claim any real expertise in um, the spatial situation Israel-Palestine, uh, uh, but these are PhDs that uh, have uh, been done at our department, and because I was involved in several of them, um, uh, I am uh, aware of what uh, uh, what the issues are. Of course, uh, Nuran Abujidi is the second speaker of today. Ismail Sheikh ha Hassam uh, worked on Nar al Barat in uh, Lebanon, a Palestinian refugee uh, camp. Uh, Abdel Rahman Kitana on Palestinian cities. Shadi Saleh, who is also here today on Jabalia. He just returned from, from, from Gaza. Uh, Alessandra Gola is the third speaker. Uh, Lynn Chabri and Dina Dahir are still working, and I'm not even mentioning the many master theses that uh, are done in our department. Uh, so these are maps probably very, very familiar to many of you. Still, I if you look at them closely, it's, uh, uh, it's kind of uh, horrible. This is the situation of historic Palestine. This is uh, the uh, UN partition plan where uh, that the green uh, areas are still uh, would still be Palestinian territory and the white would go uh, would constitute the Israeli uh, state uh, 196 the war of 1967 uh, reduced Palestine to these areas the West Bank and Gaza uh, and then uh, further um, uh, evolutions transformations further reduced, Gaza managed more or less to remain uh, a kind of uh, entity, uh, but the West Bank is uh, totally fragmented due to uh, Israeli uh, illegal uh, settlements and other happenings. Uh, so indeed, a closer look at the West Bank shows all these different lines, and it's very complicated to give you um, uh, a detailed um, uh, uh, account of what that all means. Uh, the Oslo agreements um, constituted area A, B, and C. Area A and B, that's the yellow um, uh, parts, uh, where there is a certain authority. Area e, A, the smallest one, full civil and security control by uh, the PA, the Palestinian Authority. B, uh, still uh, Israelis are involved in the security control. C, the rest, including the Israeli settlements, and that's the orange. You see that the orange is really the matrix in which uh, the fragments of what is left of the real well, of Palestine, let's say, are, are embedded. So this is uh, uh, the situation on the ground. The green line was supposedly um, the, the dividing line between the two, but then Israel uh, built the wall, that's the black line, uh, so further encroaching on uh, Palestinian territory. And the situation of uh, Jerusalem is even 
more complicated. Uh, so on the ground, it's very, very difficult to negotiate all this. And on the ground, things are happening that you would really not expect in what supposedly is a, a kind of democratic country, or at least that's uh, often um, um, claimed that Israel would be a Western uh, democratic state. Uh, but the story of how Israel seized uh, Jerusalem, to my mind, is still a very um, yeah, uh, strange story, really. Uh, uh, I have uh, read Torhuli, this book of Alona Nitschan Shiftan, um, a scholar from Technion, uh, who tells the story from an architectural history perspective, what Israel did. Um, so uh, 1967, of course, Israel won the war at that point. Um, and uh, what they did, they uh, kind of immediately occupied uh, uh, big parts of uh, Jerusalem and not only occupied, but started to build, started to have um, international competitions to, to bring in uh, famous international planners and architects, mostly from uh, the United States, who indeed participating in the planning of Jerusalem, which was then published in architectural journals, in urban journals, as a kind of uh, example of how to do the planning of a city. Um, not ignoring, in fact, the, uh, the, the fact that they were planning a city or the extensions of the city on territory that was not theirs. Uh, for those familiar with Belgium and the Netherlands, it is as if Maastricht would plan to extend itself, to make itself twice, three, four times as big, but on, on, on in Lanake uh, and, uh, and, and those, and, and, and Mazeik and these, uh, uh, these municipalities at the other side of the Belgian Dutch uh, border, which would be unacceptable uh, in, uh, in view of international law, in view of international cooperation, etc., etc. So, what is totally unacceptable in um, in a European context or in in a, so in a Western context that that uh, states are encroaching upon one one another's territory? Here, it's sim it's being done at least since 1967, uh, and not many questions asked. Well, the UN, of course. Um, uh, objects to it. Um, uh, so it's not just Jerusalem, there are all these many Israeli uh, settlements that are, uh, that, that are put on, uh, in, in the West Bank um, and then are connected with a kind of highways to uh, Israel proper. Um, then the wall is also built and then you get a, a very intricate spatial system where the road system, for example, is divided and separated. The highways are for the Israeli settlers, um, uh, and the other ways, uh, the, the local and, uh, and traditional ways, they are for the Palestinians. Palestinians are not allowed to use uh, these um, roads, meaning that if you are a farmer living here and having your olive uh, grove on the other side, uh, you need to, to make compli complicated spatial maneuvers to get um, at your land uh, to, uh, to harvest your olives or whatever you want to do there. You cannot simply cross uh, this road. Uh, so it's really building apartheid through 3D spatial interventions. That's E.L. Weizmann, also an Israeli scholar, who has uh, made this book uh, analyzing uh, all these um, tricks and, uh, and strategies uh, that Israel uses um, uh, to, uh, to build, to construct facts on the ground. Uh, the segregated road system, uh, uh, you find on the internet also this type of map. Uh, uh, the apartheid works through different um, colors for uh, the license plates of the cars. So depending on the color of your license plate, you can use certain roads and other roads you cannot use. If you are uh, a, an, a resident of Jerusalem, here of East Jerusalem, even if you are Palestinian, you have a bit more freedom to move around than, uh, than if you are uh, without um, uh, uh, such a residence. Uh, that means that if for example, when I went to visit the West Bank, uh, my friends here 
had to arrange for a driver that had a residence permit living here because this person could cross the border and take me in a car to etc etc uh, so it has a lot of impact on daily life and that's i think the the what to me was very very striking in being there in israel the yellow part of israel um, uh, everything is done to give visitors and 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 inhabitants alike uh, at least jewish inhabitants everything is done to give the impression this is a very um, rich a uh, country that is very civilized, that is on a par with European and United States um, level of, um, yeah, of econ economy, but also of political uh, uh, conduct, etc. They do everything to make sh to to give that impression. The moment you cross that border, I never went to Gaza, but I went here. You see that people living in this part in uh, the West Bank, uh, that they cannot conduct their life in a kind of uh, normal way. So the, uh, that's, and that's the, ide ideologically, I think it's very important to understand that, that Israel tries to convey the message, we are a normal Western country, which they aren't. I we are a democracy, which they aren't. Um, and, and that is one of the reasons why there is also uh, this solidarity. Uh, of course, the history of displacement, the Nakba 1948, many, many, many Palestinians uh, having uh, to leave their homes uh, to, to take refuge elsewhere, hence all these camps. Uh, the same happening in 67. Uh, this is where uh, Palestinians live nowadays, so there are camps all over the region. Uh, still in Gaza, there are also still camps, so part of the population uh, was living there already before, but a huge part of the Gaza population are refugees coming from other parts of uh, uh, Palestine, of the former Palestine, I should say. Uh, and then the settler colonialism, I think it's, uh, it's good to give you a, a kind of definition, working definition. Colonialism, I think, uh, can be neutrally um, defined as the drive to cultivate land that is supposedly virgin. That's a kind of uh, innocent definition. A land where no one lives and that is colonized. Um, uh, this illusion that nobody is living on the land is 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 very dear to colonizers. Uh, for example, in the, at the point of the creation of Israel, Palestine was presented to the Zionists and the people wanting to move to Israel as a land without people, uh, for a people without land being the Jews. So colonization is most uh, colon colonialism is most often. Uh, economically motivated, it's supported by European st state, by the churches, etc. Um, but it's causing, certainly in the long run, uh, serious antagonisms with the people who do live on that land, land and who were ignored in the first place. So the United States, of course, is, is, was a settler colony. Australia was a settler colony. C Canada was a settler co colony. This, these are the, the nation states where the settlers from Europe are now, um, and their descendants, of course, uh, have become much more numerous than the first people. And uh, if you, yeah, I think it's correct to call, is to call Israel's strategy uh, in the West Bank also settler colonialism. And uh, the strategy seems to be, as I said already, to create facts on the ground and uh, that someday might lead to a redrawing again of the maps. So all these maps are not internationally recognized. That needs to be uh, very clear from the beginning. Uh, yeah, this is a bit more uh, uh, statistics about um, the West Bank and, and Gaza, uh, how many people live there, etc. Uh, I think I'll uh, skip uh, this. Uh, uh, for, because it gives more details on what I said already. And I think, uh, well, I leave you with this image of uh, the wall and one of the uh, colonies, the settler colonies, the Israeli settler colonies that are beyond the wall, meaning on the Palestinian side of um, that uh, 
big wall that was built in the early uh, 2000s and that supposedly is guaranteeing Israel's security, supposedly. Okay, I leave it at that, and I'm uh, glad to give the floor then to Nuran Abujidi. Thank you, Hilda. Good evening. Um, I'm going to present to you today uh, 20 years of research on Palestine, in which that, uh, like, you know, materializing in my book, Herbicide in Palestine Spaces of Oppression and Resilience. So the lecture will be in these uh, four parts war and the city, just to show you how much city development and war machine are intertwined and how the justification pretext all these discourses that appeared to justify uh, understand the event of war uh, with focus on herbicide and then how herbicide is materializing in Palestine but at the same time showing how the Palestinians are so active agents in shaping the contours of the struggle by developing also what kind of and shapes and types of Palestinian resistance we have. In the comfort of our living room, we are always confronted with these types of images. Images of destruction, of built environment, of houses, infrastructure, all sorts of livelihood. Then we close our TV with the sketch in our head that this is a place of misery, of backwardness, of people maybe not worthy for living, and we forget about it. But the impact of this destruction that is instant in your, this moment of watching your TV, I will be emotional has huge impacts on people who are not only struggling, suffering in this moment of violence, they are losing their livelihood, the place they call home, where they built family, memories, loves, and also all the ambitions for the future. Gaza is not a poor place. Gaza is a place where people with the very little resources they had wanted to celebrate life. They built life. But the most important thing to also to keep in mind that the trauma of this event will ever last in their memories. So within these types of political ecologies, at least in research, in academia, we always tend to focus on the bright side of civilization, celebrating cities, architecture, all these symbols of identity and how we are connected to each other. While at the same time, through all history from colonialism to the se First and Second World War, we had huge impacts on our cities by destroying them. But we don't want to yeah, sort of highlight that. So that is part of my research, looking at the city as a scene of catastrophic death. The city as a target in the warfare and colonial context. But at the same time, show how the military elites and their doctrines exercise direct or indirect type of urban planning and design, a profession that I am very proud of and I was trained for in a way that how design and, and spatial planning are used as a tool of oppression, of control, rather than as a tool for emancipation and empowerment. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, in all these types of events, from the Bosnian War, from Afghanistan, Iraq, and now Palestine, all these type of damage is sort of justified as a collateral damage or damage for security reason. But of course, within international law, we know that the collateral damage is an incidental casualties and property damage that results from military actions. So it should be precise, it should be also very concrete in certain locations for that purpose. And for security reason, it only targets great military significance such as bridges, military compounds, and so forth. So I wanted to use all these definitions so that we can apply, okay, what does it, what is going on now in Gaza? So we can understand this event of total destruction of cities. Other political violence uh, also takes place during this destruction of cities uh, and villages is ethnic cleansing or genocide. And this is intent to erase, extre exterminate a certain target group because of their ethnic background, and because of this claim to the land or the property that they have. And normally, many, many forms of political violence happen at the same time. So an herbicide will happen in combination of ethnic with ethnic cleansing or with genocide. To, because it's very s long story, I try to squeeze 75 years in few slides. So I will be focusing on herbicide here, the intentional destruction of urbanity. And there are so many discourses and schools of thought on that, but I will only use the one that I feel, it, and I, from my research, is applicable to the Palestinian case. So the aim of herbicide here is to destroy plurality, diversity, and heterogeneity in favor of homogeneity. We can see that. Hilda mentioned in all this matrix of control that was built in Palestine, like the apartheid war. And it is very important to see how all these systems, the double systems that are built in a way that the Palestinians are invisible. Especially when you say like Hilda, crossing from the Israeli to the Palestinian side, you don't see like what's happening behind that wall. It is meant actually to make the Palestinians aliens to, to their own environment by all these apparatus of separation. Regulations, laws, and name it. So this slide shows you also who is entitled to what in terms of rights, from voting, accessibility to certain, to certain services, and so forth. You showed the license plate, but also all these ID identification documents are also colored that you can directly know who lives where and what kind of entitlement he has. But what are the characteristics of herbicide? When, when can we say this is an herbicide act so that you can prove it and it is also a war against, it is a war crime. So it is a widespread or total damage. The place of destruction is demonized or dehumanized. So all this propaganda that you hear now, that I will come to that in, in a moment. And that destruction is exercised to achieve spatial recon reconfiguration for the purpose of control. And of course, it is intentional and planned. But most importantly, it leaves, is, it leaves and causes a sense of loss, tragic experience, and significant impacts on the inhabitants' uh, recog recognition of place and other and that the destruction transforms not only the urban form of the city, but also its meaning and perception. So when we say like, when we, it is that intentional and how the place is demonized and dehumanized, I will take some, some examples before the attack on Fallujah. This was the pretext that the enemy has got a face. He is called Satan. He is in Fallujah, and we are going to destroy him. So all this process of othering the enemy, who is considered inhuman and absolute eternality, Satan-like nature. So the home of the enemy is the incubator of the terrorist whose Satan nature is extended to his habitat and is also deemed to be the producer of other terrorist Satan. So this type of depiction 
will construct and cast the enemy and his habitat beyond any juridical, legal, and humanitarian consideration. Thus, the nihilism of Satan terrorists and his habitat is justified and is perceived as a necessary act of purification and cleansing of this cancerous danger. In the past six weeks, these are the statements that you hear on the media about fighting human animals and invoking the Amalek, which is a quote from the Old Testament that is calling to kill them all, not only men, women, kids, but also everything that belongs to the other, trees, animals, and so forth. So this is part of the preparation of the opinion, public opinion, that what will happen is necessary, and it has actually an important aspect of purification of these Satan's terrorists. Now looking at the Zionist history in Palestine, and these are very important, as Hilda mentioned, so the whole Zionist doctrine, and at the end of the 19th century, is to establish a Yodemstad, Jewish state, in a land without people, for a people without land. So it is the, the very first moment of this fabrication and uh, propaganda that justifies all the action that will take place later on to erase the Palestinian place, space, and establish the Israeli one. I think you explained this, the different two words, and of course the Balfour Declaration, where Her Majesty decided to offer Palestine as a solution for the Jewish problem after the Holocaust and the Second World War, and after that, the United Nations resolution dividing the land for the western part of the historic Palestine to be Israel and the eastern part to be Palestine. So since 1948, a systematic destruction of the Palestinian place took place by destroying or erasing 500 villages and towns to start establishing and constructing the Israel state and of course claiming identity over the land. So it, was, it is not only, so it is a destruction, construction, reconstruction, and transformation of a complete territory to achieve this dream of the Zion state as a Jewish state. But of course to do that, you need a complete <coughs> set of apparatus, the matrix control I mentioned here, but also land confiscation, use of force of occupation, military laws, invasions, destruction, and the matrix of control that is all these surveillance tools that are used across the Palestinian territory uh, to channel and control movement and entitlement to land and uh, accessibility to services and so forth. So in many places, especially in Hebron, for example, in Kalkilia and in many cities, it will take the Palestinians hours to go just from one city to another, to go to access a hospital between a village in Nablus and Nablus city, or to go to university or to school like in Jerusalem. The wall is dividing many neighborhoods. So just to give you an idea about the scale of this matrix of control, how it is ingrained in every aspect of the everyday life activity. And I think this is already mentioned by Hilda, but you see the amount of the Jew Jewish colonies on the in the West Bank, on Palestinian land, and all the infrastructure to connect only these Jewish colonies with infrastructure that is only entitled to the settlers. So at the end, if you see that map, it you see that the Palestinian, Palestine, is a Palestinian archipelago of defragmented areas floating in the sea of Israeli-controlled areas, just presenting the Palestinian alien do, to their own environment. So there is no essence of a normal life. So we can no longer talk about Palestine. Palestine becomes more an idea. And all this call for two-state solution has no foundation and it will be never achieved just 
as you saw, there, there are no essence of all that. So we are talking only about Palestinian space. All the Palestinians that, all the spaces that host Palestinian experiences. And mainly, I will only focus on this in, in this lecture, the spaces of exile and refuge, because I think this is the main, I one of the main experiences uh, of half of the population in Gaza. So after the 48 and 67 wars, the expulsion, destruction of Palestinian cities, towns, and villages, loss of life, and the following exile constituting, constituted a concluding chapter for local communities that testify to the disappearance of what was once Palestine. Thus, Palestine is vanished from the geopolitical map of the Middle East. A new emerging state of Israel was to surface. A new history, urbanity, and identity were to be formulated. At the same time, novel Palestinian geospaces were constructed and physically manifested in their exile and out of their original context, as it, at, as it is best visible in refugee camps inside Palestine, as Edward Said puts it. Going quickly now to show how herbicide is manifested using all what this background of this matrix of control, uh, how, the, how all this matrix of control also facilitates the Israeli army to reinvade and uh, organize military uh, operations in Palestinian controlled areas. So in 2000, between 2002 and 2005, so this is Nablus city, 16, 60 kilometers northern of Jerusalem, one of the largest uh, cities, the economic capital of Palestine, and it is a city between two mountains, so it is uh, along a valley. And the old town that w is the subject of this herbicide activities is a city dating ba back to the Roman times, so it is also declared as a heritage site. You can see all this type of Arabic Islamic urban fabric. So, so on a city scale, so this matrix of control materializes on this in intensity of having 14 Israeli settlements in the Nablus district, especially that it is in the valley, so it was controlled by all these settlements on top of the mountains. Two major military bases around the city, so Nablus is a linear city, so you have checkpoint in entry and exit. And of course, many other checkpoints on other types of roads. And of course, uh, a main Israel dump site and industrial park. So all the waste, industrial waste, is also exposed to the agricultural land around Nablus. To enter the city, the Israeli army developed different types of techniques. And in this invasion, they were trying also new technology by invading the city, not using its streets or public spaces, but by bombing holes through walls. So they were moving inside the urban fabric. And we are talking about a Roman site, and the existing fabric is from the 17th, 18th century Ottoman fabric. And this is just to give you an example. So I mapped all the holes in the in certain uh, uh, housing uh, clusters, and if you see the insanity and the number of holes that were bombed in one housing block just to cause more structural destruction of this heritage site, just to show you how aggressive and how brutal uh, the invasion towards the city, uh, just to uh, exercise this authority and power relationship towards the city and its inhabitants especially when you have holes in structural elements like a cross vault. This is by time, of course, the whole building will collapse. If we look at the extent of damage, so 75% of the urban structure was subject to a damage. And of course, you see how, much, how many big family houses were uh, totally damaged. Uh, to to just to give you a scale, so Nablus is one, one and a half kilometer length and almost half a kilometer uh, width with around 25,000 inhabitants. <coughs> Attacking an old city with all this modern technology, 
uh, from Apache helicopters F-16, uh, and of course the, bu the bulldozer that is a very important uh, destruction machine, and it is actually the nickname of Sharon, who used it for houses, uh, houses demolition also in Jerusalem, and how all this heavy machinery just going through all these very narrow roads inside the city, also causing destruction across all the areas that they were passing through. The typology of destroyed buildings, it was mainly residential areas. Just to give uh, also a parallel to, towards what's happening now in Gaza. Of course, the pretext is to eliminate the Palestinian resistance, the terrorists, by trying to find them via all this type of destruction, claiming that they are hiding inside these houses. But if we look carefully about to the extent of damage, the typology of destroyed buildings, and the location of all these destroyed buildings, it was as if you are emptying the whole urban fabric from a very strategic locations to break the continuity of the urban fabric and also the social fabric. So causing more destruction to the city for, a, for the main purpose of military control. Yeah, I'm going back. Yeah, what are the impacts on the human experience? The closure and siege. During these invasions, people can experience 100 days of curfews, just not being allowed to go outside. And in, in, in between 2002 and 2005, people could hardly leave the city. So the kids who, who grew up during all this period didn't know even what other cities look like. They were confined to their own neighborhoods. And Nablus, of course, is the economic capital, so all the villages around the city have huge economic dependency on the city. They couldn't reach the city, couldn't reach medical help, schools, universities, and so forth. And this toll of this collective detention, collective death, and the never uh, stopping loss of the loved ones, and this disappearance of normalcy, how the domestic space, by just bombing a hole is through your living room, how your domestic space becomes a military terrain. And I will, co uh, just to show this human experience during these events of invasion, so I will quote Khouri in 2014, he said, go inside, he ordered in historic broken English, inside, I am already inside. It took me a few seconds to understand that this young soldier was redefining inside to mean anything that is not visible to him at least. Me being outside within the inside was bothering him. Not only is he imposing a curfew on me, but he is also redefining what is outside and what is inside within my private sphere. Abu Shmes explains the trauma that she felt by having these young soldiers who took over her house as a military post for one month and how they were like, yeah, allowing themselves to everything inside her house. She said, it was more than I could bear to think of them using our bathrooms or opening my drawers and searching and messing our clothes or personal items. Total strangers, they have access to all the rooms. They help themselves to all of our belongings. They see themselves in our mirrors and use our sheets and towels. In a way, it was almost being violated our private lives and intimate secrets had been forcibly opened to strangers. And we were utterly helpless to do anything about it. Feeling hopeless and helpless hurts. It hurts mentally and physically. This systematic and long-term yeah, experience of this violent uh, yeah, military invasions, destruction and op oppression will also leave impacts on people's collective memory and perception of self and other. So there is a sort of colonization of the mind and controlling your imaginary about who I am towards the world. So I, my friend Amal Kawaj represented this, how the Palestinians are so much constrained towards a very limited yeah, image of what life could be. 
And in my interviews with the kids of Nablus, after so many years under curfews and closure, they were asking, do you have checkpoints in Europe? How does he look like? How does it smell like? Imagine all this by you take for granted are something that people under occupation and colonialism are even doubting about. So in this exercise to ask the kids about how they see the city, so I asked them to draw like, how do, how do you see Nablus? How did Nablus look like before the invasion? And it was so shocking. They we only remembered the act of invasion, destruction, and, and so forth. So not only could they not remember what the damaged areas looked like, they were unable to express anything other than damage, shooting, explosions, and so forth. In another artistic work or workshop with the kids of Gaza, this was one of the representation of self towards the other. You need to imagine that for Palestinians who live in the occupied Palestinian territories, maybe the only encounters they will have with an Israeli is only in the form of a soldier. Meeting up with a civilian or like non-military non Israeli is not in any chance during maybe a lifetime. So just also to imagine how they are positioning themselves towards the other, in this case, the Israeli. Now let's go back to Gaza, just very quickly, so that I try to give you some parallels towards Gaza, as Hilda mentioned, like we have eight camps in Gaza, and most of the people, 56% are refugees, and most importantly, they are refugees from the uh, nearby cities and villages that is Israel now. So this also nostalgia, not nostalgia, has been longing to go back to their place of origin that is represented in many marches of return and of course in the all the latest events. But in uh, 2004, if I'm not mistaken, correct me Shadi if I am wrong, that there was uh, unilateral uh, action, disengagement from Israel leaving Gaza and at then building up all this fence or wall with almost seven gates. So it's not entries, gates that are controlled uh, by Israel and one by, uh, by Egypt. And you can see the extent of this wall uh, as a separation wall and control wall with all the surveillance uh, you know, uh, installations that are meant also to control the life of the Gazans and channel all what is allowed to Gaza from water, electricity, also all, all, all the needs of life. So this is the fifth war, and now the, the kids of Gaza, I think we are now calling them the four wars, or old kids. So this is the only experience they had, only these invasions, destruction, and oppression, and of course losing the loved ones. So we can no longer talk about post-traumatic uh, experience for the Gazans, because it is a continuous event. And we are still counting. I think it's very difficult for me every time I give a lecture and keep updating these numbers. It is so devastating how much destruction, not only to the built environment, but also for the loss of life and uh, the number of injuries. And most importantly, also the how many thousands are also still not rescued under the rubble. If we look at uh, the typology of the destroyed building, we, c we can say that half of the Gazans' homes are destroyed, with 222,000 residential units are subject to damage, and 54 totally destroyed. Maybe you can see in the maps, it is only a coordinate for you on the map, but this is a building of 12 floors that hosts a complete bloodline between 50 to 100 persons living there. So a bomb in that building and that coordinate will erase a complete bloodline, just to, to, to put things in context and scale. Yeah, as I mentioned with this, so as a Palestinian, the occupation, colonization is part of my DNA. It is me living in Europe. If I see anybody in a military uniform for a few seconds, I will panic. I need to prepare myself to do an action because I need either to, to run because there is a military invasion or there is an, a, a 
a clash or something. So it, is n it will never go away from the collective memory. But within this experience, the Palestinians are developing tactics in their daily life activities to maneuver as a counter action, as an action of resistance to go through and break through that system of control uh, as a form of resistance. And we call it sumud, so the steadfastness going on ev in your life every day, going to the hospital, to school, to the university, to work, is an act of resistance. So after the invasion, three schools of, the of Nablus were destroyed, and uh, teachers held classes on the street because they wanted also to give this impression to the kids, life goes on and we need to continue steady and strong. Resistance through reconstruction, renovation, and claiming the city, and Alessandra will elaborate more on that. So it was not only the, it was not the official uh, uh, bodies or institutes who started actually the reconstruction in Nablus. The inhabitants themselves organized themselves in committees to claim normalcy and claim the city back. They started re re the reconstruction activities in Nablus. <coughs> and resistance through commemoration. The Palestinians don't forget their martyrs, their cause, and there is a continuous celebration of this resistance by celebrating the young martyrs who sacrificed their lives for Palestine. So if you go to Nablus, I think Hilda went uh, once with us, this is the landscape in the old city, a continuous uh, reminder of the cause. And for the Palestinians to exist is to resist. So the city that is typically a celebration of life becomes this embattled arena for continual commemoration of the never-ending events of death. And the, f the most important form of resistance is recolonize or decolonizing spaces and architecture, a trend in the past 15 years as a form of spatial resistance where the Palestinians deployed the city and its architecture for resistance using different types of forms of spatial reconfiguration techniques from barricading the city, recolonizing and appropriating occupied Palestinian land architecture. For example, the area C that Tilda was mentioning as a, it is a Palestinian land in the occupied territories, but it is under Israeli military control. So the Palestinians will claim it for one day, for a picnic, for a camp, and then they will be evacuated and then they will come back. And of course, tunneling Gaza from 2004 till now is an act of spatial resistance. The March of Return, which is one of the pillars of the Palestinian uh, refugees, five million uh, in, uh, like Palestinians in diaspora, uh, that took place uh, across the Lebanese-Israeli uh, borders in 2015 and 2021, as a reminder that we will not give up our right of return, and that, uh, that uh, yeah, sort it is sort of a symbolic action just to show that they are there and they are visible and they need to be healed because they are forgotten for 75 years in refugee camps. The same also for Gaza. As I mentioned, they come from many cities around the, around the Gaza Strip. But yeah, I will end with this that can also open a good debate later on. What is our role, academia, professionals, in supporting this emancipation and empowerment? I am calling for to decolonize knowledge, decolonize the university, and I had a very good debate with Hilda on that. Because I was taught when I came here that the colonial projects or colonies, European colonies, also had good impacts on the colonized or the colonies by bringing good infrastructure, good health, and so forth. Yeah, but it was the academia that whitewashed all these activities, the, the, oppression, the oppression and the coloni uh, colonization by developing all these types of theories around racism, social inclusion, social justice. Yeah, can we afford keeping the same references. Can I talk about social justice that is built on all these roots for, a, for a, a context like Palestine, a context like slums in India or in Latin America or a vernacular uh, village in, in, in Africa? I think this is 
something that we need to reconsider. And I am calling also to embrace this BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanction, because the Israeli academia is not only sort of silent and therefore complicit, they are so much engaged and active in feeding this colonial uh, apparatus and oppression taking place since 75 years, not via all these technologies that are used and they are known for the military technologies, but with all the theories that they are appropriating and using towards this oppressive machine, appropriating urban planning, architecture, urban design, towards the control of the Palestinian cities, especially for this swarming or walking through walls uh, technique that was developed by an academic. He is a professor of philosophy. <laughs> and also this siege of Gaza was planned and developed by a professor of Haifa University. So something also for the debate later on. Can we afford always working with colleagues, if you want to call them colleagues, or institutes who are using our disciplines, doctrines, towards an, uh, an oppressive uh, uh, yeah, regime. And I will end with this. Bilal Iddabur, he is a young uh, doctor. This was his last message before he was killed. The most important thing that we are not counting numbers. These people need to have a voice. They need also that their narrative is heard. And this is also one of why I am calling for to build up the Palestinian narrative and to see how we can empower the Palestinian cause by talking about Palestine and at the same time projecting or deconstructing the colonial, uh, the Israeli colonial narrative uh, around the Palestinians by depicting them terrorist animals and so forth. And as he mentioned, we are normal people. We, w we love life and we want to celebrate life. But our only fault that we are depicted as not worthy, subhuman and inferior. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nurhan. Thank you, Hilde, for um, a very <coughs> for interrogating um, the ways also academia is dealing uh, with all this, but showing us not only devastation but also hope uh, in this. Um, we're going to uh, ask Alexandra to join us. Is she there? Yes, I am. Do you hear me? Yeah, I do. I hope okay. you hear you. You and hear me as well. Yes, we can hear you very well. Alessandra, please, you have the floor. Thank you. So, good evening, and um, I'm um, I'm really um, honored, but also humbled, of uh, to be here with you tonight. Uh, I would say hello from the other side. So hello from the West Bank and from Nablus particularly. Um, it's going to be very difficult to squeeze in uh, 25 minutes all the things that I would like to say. So um, I will try just to tackle the most important uh, and the impo most important aspects. So um, I will um, I will build upon and and uh, catch up from um, uh, Norhan's uh, invitation uh, towards uh, for a uh, decolonization of uh, of the practice. And tonight I will try to talk to you, uh, especially um, in my um, in my quality as an academic working in Palestine as a researcher. 
um, and also as an architect co-founder of um, an independent um, uh, research and uh, uh, design initiative, uh, Yalla Project. But also, uh, I need to position myself very quickly, uh, uh, but clearly. Um, I'm talking to you as a European person who is working uh, in Palestine since 2009, before I started uh, uh, my PhD and before I started uh, my engagement as co-founder of Yalla, uh, Yalla Project. What I will try to offer to you is uh, an, uh, a specialized uh, approach, and I will try to offer a constructive critique. I think that the re recent events are showing us uh, that time, I think, has come for a frank revision also of the role of uh, the international presence uh, in uh, uh, supporting or rather dismissing uh, the aspiration of self-determination of the Palestinian people, but not only. Um, so I will try to um, elaborate and share with you uh, my experience as part uh, uh, of, of, uh, of Yalla. Um, so um, I will start by saying that uh, I will explore, first of all, two limitations. Uh, two conditions, actually, that overlap in um, settled colonialism and uh, in uh, the condition that we are enduring in, the, in, uh, in Palestine. One is settler colonialism, as I said, uh, as, um, and the way it tackles the everyday. But the second limitation, the second condition, is the influence of the international agendas uh, in Palestine through uh, projects and international initiatives. So you already have familiarized with the, with the shrinking of Palestine, but I will just try to give uh, very simple figures initially to all of you who are not really familiar with the context, just to try to take some measurement and navigate what we are talking about. So Palestine before 1948, was more than 26,000 kilometers square. Uh, and now it is reduced into a mere 6,000 kilometers squares. But you can compare it with the Flanders, that is around uh, 13,000 uh, kilometers squares. So really a small place. Uh, Hilde already introduced you to uh, a version of this map. So I'm uh, focusing on my experience in the West Bank specifically. I could never enter Gaza, never. It's very difficult, uh, even for an international or a foreign person. So here you can see highlighted in red in particular, what I, what I want to focus with you on is uh, the network, this constellation of Israeli settlements and the Israeli military outpost in yellow. So when we talk about space, uh, trying to give a specialized idea to you all tonight, the West Bank now counts um, around uh, 5,600 kilometers squares. But of those, the 29% is confiscated by either the Israeli settlements or the army. And the remaining 61%, once you deduce those 29%, the remaining 61% is under the Israeli administrative and security control, the area C that Hilda was mentioning uh, briefly before, and also Nurhan. What it means that whatever you want to do there as Palestinians has to pass through the decision of, um, of the Israeli uh, apparatus. So what is left actually in the hands of the Palestinians? The full control of Palestinians on the West Bank is limited on a mere 1,500 kilometer squares. So uh, here I would like, uh, I think this um, quote encapsulates well uh, the condition of the panopticon that was uh, created uh, little by little um, uh, since uh, through this colonial, um, uh, settled colonialism system. So the communities in the occupied territories are backlit, isolated from one another and subject 
to scrutiny both collectively and individually by an observer who remains unseen. Actually, when we when we think about this constellation that you see in the map, and I think about it, my everyday experience uh, driving through uh, Palestine, um, opening my, my window, uh, looking from the balcony or looking at the window from, from my office, uh, it is, you have the feeling that the hills have eyes on you because everywhere you turn, you can either see a settlement or you can see an Israeli outpost. What do I mean? I try to, to draw you in kind of physically for a moment on this sample. It's a 10 kilometer per 10 kilometer sample, very close to Nablus where I am now, right at the, at the out, in the outskirts of Nablus, the village of Hawara, a very small uh, commercial village uh, that, is, uh, that has grown uh, along one of the main uh, roads that connects north to south the West Bank. So you can see here on the left side, you can see the constellation around Hawara of the Israeli settlements and military outposts. So, and on the left, on the right, sorry, what is left for the Palestinians? So if you think about just about the special occupation, places that are physically taken, this is the distribution, small hollows. This is why also um, Eyal Weizmann calls it the hollow land. But then around each Israeli outpost of any sort, so you have also a buffer that is inaccessible for the Palestinians. Why? Because it's patrolled with armed people, either the Israeli army or, um, or armed settlers. But then if you think about it in a 3D condition, each uh, Israeli outpost or, or uh, settlement is on a hilltop, which means that everything is under the visual control. Whatever movement we do is under the Israeli milit military uh, and, and visual control of settlements. But also when we think about the houses, something very material, that our home, a place where to live, we have a selective housing right. While on one side, on one hand, we had just in, in this year, 119 demolitions. And in the last five years, in area C, 99.1 uh, building permits uh, uh, that Palestinians uh, submitted to the Israeli um, authorities were rejected 99.1%. On the other hand, we have just uh, in 2022, 28,000 and more new Israeli uh, 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 dwelling units in within the settlements that you see in red, and 900 new Jewish localities built since 1948. So um, here, um, I think, this quote well encapsulates how the occupation is really all encompassing. It's partial, it's visual, it's mental, it's metaphysical because it also um, uh, passes through uh, whatever we do digitally. Uh, so the attempt here is not to destroy just the space, but it's also is tackling the, the very everydayness, disturbing and disrupting a normal living. Now I want to enter into the second condition that we have to really tackle. And as a European person, I, I think in particular, uh, I, I feel compelled to do that. That is the presence of international, the international agencies locally. So we just said that the space, the, the, the remaining space of the West Bank and, and, and and Palestine in general, of the occupied uh, Palestine, is very tiny. And nevertheless, there we have approximately 440 international NGOs operating. It is impossible to trace the amount of funding that is poured on, on Palestine every year. It's very, very difficult to trace it back. And it's impossible to calculate how many internationals work here permanently on a short term, uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a permanent term, but it's a really important presence. So I will talk from also my own experience 
as a former member of international uh, international projects and international cooperation. So since 2000, and my, my observation, personal one is uh, since 2009, now 15 years, but through YALA projects is five years that we are also joining together all sorts of observations that we have collected in the diverse uh, um, uh, uh, trajectories uh, of each uh, and one of uh, everyone in, in our team. So from a simple monetary um, uh, perspective, uh, the most recurrent shortcoming is uh, the interruption of funding and projects based on the administrative elections that happened in the West Bank Almost every every year, every every year and a half, we have around elections here in the in the municipalities. We also have to acknowledge an uneven distribution of funding that is very frequent between the local and the foreign partners. In it is most it is quite often, most often I would say that the local partners uh, receive less benefit less of that pouring of money at the end of the day. Also the inaccessibility for, of, uh, for small initiatives to access those funding because the application requirements and uh, the modalities, the, the methods, uh, it is absolutely inapplicable for small businesses that nevertheless in the local context uh, represent around the 70% even if, if not more of the local um, of the local uh, work power, and also um, they would need a very basic and, and small grant to have very serious and long-standing achievement. But they cannot uh, because of papers, because of, of uh, because of language, and also from the Palestinian side, we have to acknowledge we it's important really to use. Uh, the term acknowledging from the Palestinian side, an increased dependency on AIDS, expecting that someone will, will come and provide the funding. Is it necessary? No, I don't think so. From our practice, I can say this. So, so on, uh, from the side of uh, uh, pr the, pro the making of the project, the, the, uh, the preparation and, and uh, uh, the creation of, uh, of initiatives, uh, it is not rare to find a prioritization of international agendas over local needs. Uh, I can say it again, being a former insider as well. Uh, there's also this receptivity of local content proposals when um, foreign agendas, especially of big donors, do not really meet local necessities or, uh, um, or uh, let's say, urgencies. It is also an uh, often, uh, I think, even unwilling, let's say, mechanical imposed imposition of methodologies used for uh, for and within projects. And also the way the, the selection process uh, is, is designed to choose local uh, and international team members. From the Palestinian side, I have to add, there is also, uh, we have to acknowledge uh, a reduced project making attitude. Uh, uh, um, so from also another shortcoming, it's uh, in international projects, is uh, the fact of uh, being mostly output focused as an approach and to be short term um, uh, designed. So let's say that uh, an average international projects lasts as a time horizon between two years and five years maximum. Uh, what is also very problematic is that there is a lack of follow up and, uh, uh, and of a consistent handing in process after the project, the outcome is achieved. And finally, the, uh, the donor budget plans timing determines the use of funding and which kind of projects are financed. It depends if, if you are lucky and you want to propose a project, perhaps apply at the end of the, of the deadline, um, of the financial deadline, financial terms of one of a big donor. Perhaps he has money he didn't, he didn't spend and he doesn't know how to spend and he's on a, on a hurry to spend. 
we had recently a conversation about this with a with a partner and um from the cultural aspect we have also a prevailing cultural attitude from the donor so uh, it's kind of uh, um is stronger in the pushing in uh, the, the way projects are written, the kinds of concepts and procedures that are used, the kind of methodologies that are applied, and also the practice in terms of everyday work environment. And also there is uh, often still uh, a kind of culturally rushed approach with the local context and uh, often having experts coming and not understanding and not being fully aware of all the cool cultural toolkits that they have to to possess uh, to deal with uh, with the local context in a in a peer to peer way rather than on, uh, uh, with a um, uh, top down approach and finally this kind of screening procedures, administrative and bureaucratic procedures um, uh, also um, apply a, a, a change or modify or uh, adapt contents and narrative through the controlled use, use of language within reports and, and publications, including the, the academic publication and um, the funding selection criteria that uh, screen uh, also the past of, uh, uh, of candidates uh, rather truly often. And also there is a uh, uh, recurrent, the contextualized uh, use of terms and conditions in, uh, in contracts. So for example, in our own experience as Yalla, more than once we have to turn down um, uh, fundings because within uh, the final contract that we had to sign, there were terms and conditions that were incompatible or controversial if applied to Palestinian citizens. So I want to briefly reflect on a, in a constructive way. I, I made a, a, a critique, a point after point, about the shortcomings. Is it just to criticize? No. Can we propose something different? Yes. Is Are there feasible alternatives that work better, that are fairer to each other? I think yes. And uh, we have uh, on our back five years experience trying to find one of these formulas. And it's it's working. It's working well despite ma the many crises that we passed through. So, uh, what is Yala Project? First of all, uh, Yala Project is a research by doing hub uh, on social spatial issues and urban re revitalization um, that was uh, established in uh, October two thousand eighteen. So we are just five years old uh, last month. Um, uh, our overarching approach is based on four main ideas. The first is hybridizing interdisciplinary applied research and social enterprise together. Uh, and now you will see later wow, why. Um, secondly, uh, we prefer counters instead of desks. So we are an office-less uh, entity. We uh, work through social businesses as an interface with local communities to integrate consistently within the local tissue and become part of it. Um, uh, we work through an urban living lab um, approach, structure, uh, inspiration, let's say, adapted but to the local context, and we work as a network. Our overarching goals are uh, to produce a grounded knowledge uh, that feeds uh, with new contents uh, from the field, uh, not only uh, the academic debate, but also the professional practice and, uh, and also contributes to the further development of knowledge in the field. We work through a few simple working principles. The first is working as a collective. We never work alone. We do not put our brand on everything and anything. We operate to join forces 
our primary work is to catalyze and support local initiatives in the city side by side with other actors and not as head or chief of, of something. Uh, we look at the city as together as an asset of potentials that is unexpressed, but also a series of obstacles that must be addressed and uh, opportunities uh, for action. Secondly, we work hands on every day. It's, it's an everyday routine, an everyday practice. We operate as part of the local community. So we are not tutors, we are not consultants, we are not the experts. We are everyday makers that open locally, for example, a cafe and, um, and a small hostel. So this is how people get to know us and this is how we start, uh, we start a conversation to solve problems together and to create something together. Very important, we are financially independent and self-sustainable. This is core to decolonizing our practice in the field. Uh, it is possible, even with very few resources, to do something impactful, we just need to think out of the box. How we work, in, in our case, we created two containers. One is a research and design environment that is more, let's say, our think tank, but it is supported in terms of content and in terms of, uh, uh, of budget by our social enterprise that works as um, uh, a cultural cafe, a heritage uh, hostel and, and guest house, and uh, an agency uh, creating, um, working in uh, heritage tourism development on a small scale, very small scale. We started at three. Uh, we work through this learning by doing loop. This is a our systematic way of working everywhere. We, we go in every, any field we tackle. So we have our project phase, its implementation also uh, is, is completed by a feedback phase that learns again, puts everything into discussion and further develops it and think, it, think it's further. As we said, the everyday, as also Nurhan has, has uh, clarified very well, the everyday is the battlefield here in Palestine. The, the everyday is a military is a military target. Fine. The everyday is also our battlefield. It's not just we don't leave it just to someone else. This is where we work. We work on space and society, and we work on with time. With a, we are not in a hurry. We are. Uh, uh, we propose a process-oriented approach rather than an output-oriented approach. So we take the time that, it, that is necessary. This is our project zero on Nablus, just to provide you with a, with a quick, concrete overlook about what we actually do, what, the, what does it mean? Okay, so this is the city of Nablus that you already know, and the, here it is exactly where we are located. So this is how we started. Uh, Nablus Old Town is an urban guerrilla location, still it is, marginalized, entrenched place, as also Nurhan was, has fleshed out so brilliantly. We have a vision instead, let's rewrite it, okay? Nablus is an old town, uh, is a safe space, is vibrant, welcoming, and also sustainable. What do we do? In our, in, in our case here, we first of all worked on finding spatial levers and social levers that we can build upon, okay? Second, second part is uh, through an acupunctural approach to the field, we have very small budgets. We, are, we started as a team of, of three people and a few occasional friends passing by, we have to choose strategically the site, the smallest possible, the most impactful anyhow. The two trajectories that you are seeing here, seeing here in 2018 when we started did not exist, but we drew these lines in 2018. It was an anticipation of what we could mobilize if we were there with a certain, a certain kind of interface. Finally, we have to acknowledge that we are working in an in-war context. This is not a post-war 
context. We have Israeli raids continuously in, in the neighborhood and, uh, and in Nablus in general. So we have to, to succeed in a fragile, entrenched and in stable context. How? Is it, it's impossible to do that. No, it's, it is possible. It's a struggle, but it is possible. We need to have set clear long run objectives but also a series of short-run tactical actions and be ready to reroute, have multiple options. This is the way we operated all these five years. Incrementality, so we started with a very small investment, not risky, and then uh, working through our um, social businesses, a very tiny one, we started to produce a social network, but also a, a small source of income that was again and again put back in circle to upscale and to upgrade um, uh, and to expand further. Uh, it is important for us to understanding the local mindset and community. When I said that it takes time, two years projects is nothing, it's not enough. And also five years, if you come from outside, it's not enough. You need a lot of time just to listen, just to mingle, just to be part of uh, of, of the place. Uh, our observation is always an active one, being inside the local community, part participating with our social business. We achieve also at the end a synthesizing of who is doing what, uh, uh, local geography of people, and also it's very important, a part that is often missing, acknowledging and integrating local key roles. Uh, often they do not speak English, which is fine. Uh, it, it's something that we have to, to find the time to acknowledge. Here it's space-wise, what do we do? Uh, it's re-inhabiting, negotiating, and rewriting collectively. We started, and then we have a feedback, and then we see how it goes, and we see how it doesn't go. It's a it's a it's a series of failing and uh, trying and uh, trial and error and perfecting. Here is um, the guest house that we rehabilitated. Uh, it was uh, bombed in 2001 through in the herb herbicide period that Nurhan has highlighted and has uh, become uh, a hub for local and international travelers. But also you can see here on the right how it was at a certain point during COVID-19 adapted by one of the local universities to find a space for graduation projects. This is our rooftop, how it was, and some of the uses it evolved through in our five years from concert hall to a wedding venue. Uh, we are open to uh, propose us, we offer a space, we unlock spaces and we unlock also the local community. Uh, we see if, 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 if there is a potential, our duty is to support it. So here are just a few, a, a few faces and a few spaces that we could unlock during our trajectory. Also this way, we make space for active citizenship that comes from within the local communities. I will, I will there is not one community, there are many. So it, power, it, it passes from uh, hiking in the, uh, in the city and reappropriating the city. All these people that you see on the right are from other parts, are from also from um, uh, Arab Israeli uh, villages. Uh, Palestinians from the 48 land, so-called, um, um, and so on and so forth. And also experimenting new uses with, uh, with groups that didn't find a space before. And finally, we also use social media as a kind of space that we have to work through to complete that feedback and follow-up phases that I was tackling before. I'm, I'm wrapping up finally our local impact uh, since 2018 until now, we have achieved uh, to support the birth of nine new activities beyond us and the upgrading and expansion of 15 existing businesses in our neighborhood, uh, plus the creation of four women-led businesses, 
the uh, renovation of poor local housing, the creation of 13 job positions within Niala, uh, and uh, hosting more than 60 volunteers uh, between uh, academic um, academic scholars uh, and uh, and uh, au pair uh, uh, au pair uh, uh, youth traveling around, and finally. Our investment in our case zero, in the initial investment uh, was only 5,400 euros. Uh, through the kind of loop that you have seen in the scheme, we managed to achieve a 50,000 euros progressive investment that was self-developed by our business and affiliated activities. Uh, all this attracted on other and other spaces and other communities within our neighbor neighbors an estimated around three million euros uh, for rehabilitating uh, spaces and activities, the creation of more than 30 jobs positions, and we went through a pandemic, one year of intermittent Israeli campaigns and the current uh, the current war uh, campaign. This is I leave you with one last shot how it was our, our road on the left when we started and how uh, the urban landscape is now that uh, I'm, I'm talking, the, the plants and the lighting that you see, it's not our work. Uh, it's uh, These are our neighbors that finally opened again their derelict shops, uh, upgraded their businesses and started creating, building up on the, uh, spontaneously um, uh, the urban landscape. Thank you very much. And here also, I leave you with a few freebies, a very interesting selection of uh, readings about the cultural impact of international projects uh, and uh, the calling for uh, the colonization of practice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alessandra, um, for uh, continuing that same kind of combination of giving us a fierce critique um, of what is happening on the ground, but also showing how alternatives, uh, alternative social action, academic action is, uh, is made possible. Um, we've got um, 20 minutes for, for questions. So that's not a lot, but uh, that uh, should give us uh, enough time to discuss some of the issues. Uh, of course. So. Whoever is raising hands, Laura will start there perhaps we can take two or three questions and then can I invite the two speakers here present to join me um, I'll give you these they're a bit higher I'll just disappear in the background uh, thank you very much to uh, all the presenters it's uh, really interesting and uh, necessary research thanks so much um, I think this is primarily a question to Nurhan, but I'd be interested in everybody's contributions. So, uh, kind of, uh, settler colonial Zionist discourse asserts that Jews belong in the land of Israel, that it's their land historically, culturally, etc. Uh, how can we uh, assert Palestinian right to the land without using precisely that discourse? That's my question. Thank you. I think by taking two items, who said? Just okay. Okay. So I think you, what what you are saying, we need to de decolonize the narrative itself, which is important. It was asked to Edward Said, by the way, and he said, nobody is denying the right of the Jews existed before. That's that's correct, but who said that? one minority 
have more entitlement to the land than the other. Because, and I think that this is another argument that I will say. We are the original Jews. We are. So I think we are from the Canaan time till now, we went through all these phases that the land went through. So we were Jews, Christians, maybe now Muslims, and a mix of other religions, you know. I think this is how we can decolonize. We are not denying anyone the right to exist in that land. But it is, for me, Palestine. So why, why should we go through all these type of destruction, colonization, to live and coexist together? Before 1948, we lived together. It was not a sort of religious war. Because this is how it is projected now by its, you know, creating those all these uh, propaganda and pretext about Hamas as an Islamic terror group, you know, just projecting them as different and they are anti-Jewish, which is not the case. Nablus, the three religions live together. We cohabit together. We are Palestinians. So this is what I am saying, that uh, we are the original Jews. People are tired, it's too late. <laughs> Overwhelmed, maybe it's too much as well. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm from uh, the capital of Palestine, I come from Jerusalem. Um, you, you just talked about, um, Hilda first talked uh, about the separation between Jerusalem and the uh, West Bank and the differences um, in the buildings and so on. But actually, I just want to add that if you look at West Jerusalem and East Jerusalem, you would see in West Jerusalem there is maybe 20, 30 uh, Kran, and in East Jerusalem maybe you find nothing or one. So this is how the Israeli also <coughs> deal with the Palestinians like me who lives in Jerusalem. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to see the other point. Da -da -da. Uh, uh, okay, uh, but they also Hebron in Hebron. It's not also uh, like if if you've been to Hebron. Hebron is the upper level <laughs> is colonized, occupied it by the settlers who are mostly going or coming uh, from the States or from Europe who lives there and throw, they threw all their things on the uh, original people who used to live uh, and still living on the lower uh, place. And there's also checkpoints. If you want to go to visit your aunt or uncle in from one neighborhood to another neighborhood, you have to do all this road because Ashuhada Street is closed. So if you want to go from here to the station of Leuven, you have to go probably through Haverly and come back. Uh, last point I want to add, uh, which is related to all of us here living in Europe, and we pay our taxes, um, that Alessandra mentioned about the conditional funding, that we as a Palestinian association, as I'm a part of it, um, we refuse to take funding from the EU, because the EU as well, um, they oblige you to sign the annex for the conditional funding, as Alessandra mentioned. So as a small organization, like the Palestinian Circus, we have 50% of our funding is gone because of this conditional funding. So this is where your taxes goes, just to let you know. So you have to be aware of where you put your taxes in Europe. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Just to uh, f follow up on this, uh, your first question was about something we I didn't understand, and a couple of people, your the, the presence of something like crane or in. in yeah, yeah, but what was it? What were you referring to?
build a new building. Okay. In West Jerusalem, they give uh, permits to make a new buildings. But in East Jerusalem, maybe, <laughs> I don't know, less than half percent that okay. you are able to build. Yeah. We pay in East Jerusalem higher taxes than West Jerusalem, mm. but we get 25% of the services that they get in uh, West Jerusalem. Okay. And that's the differences as well, how they treat uh, people, originally Palestinians, people, and you uh, settlers who live in my own city, but they have a better treatment. Okay. And the second thing is perhaps Alexandra can come in. Uh, there is the, the conditional funding thing, which perhaps you could explain, or Alessandra? Uh. It, it very much depends on uh, which kind of entity is releasing uh, grants uh, and which, uh, so and uh, also from where uh, the agency comes from. But I can cite something that very much uh, resonates with the academic life. For example, the Marie Curie Scholarship requests as one of the conditions uh, to release entirely all the raw data to uh, to the donor uh, for uh, studies about Palestine occupation etc it means to release to the donor very sensitive data that might um, uh, that might endanger uh, civilians from the Palestinian side so very recently, uh, one of my colleagues has had to turn down one of these, working in Yalla, had to turn down one of these opportunities because other, he had to choose. You have a fantastic career in, far, in front of you, but then you have to compromise. You release those data and you know that there is a high possibility that this data end up eventually somehow to someone who will misuse them. You cannot do that. So, of course, all this kind of um, international grants need to be uh, rethought or adapted, at least for war context. This also concerns, for example, Ukraine. You cannot, if you release surveys, even physical surveys or social profiling in a place that is, is in war, you really endanger uh, your, uh, uh, your community. It's something you can't do. This is one example uh, 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 on many, many. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can add to that, that for me, one of the most shocking things in what I learned uh, during uh, these engagement with uh, Palestinian uh, researchers um, and, and people who have knowledge of um, what is happening on the ground, I remember um, a lecture by A.L. Weissman that I was really, really shocked because he explained, he had interviewed several high-level uh, military people who were studying, can you imagine, studying avant-garde practices in architecture, urbanism, in the, in the visual arts. They, they studied practices like, well, the people who are architects might know them, stalker in, in, in Rome, alternative sub uh, practices that think about themselves as being subversive and alternative and very much about building communities uh, with uh, diversity of people and so on. But in the mean, um, and, and the Israeli military were looking at this kind of practices, for example, uh, stalker in, in Rome, what they did was um, uh, making kind of walks that ignored um, property boundaries, for example, as a way of protesting um, the, the grabbing of the land by uh, real estate developers pushing aside uh, people who found refuge in, on that land. That was around Rome. But it's that kind of tactics, which were meant to be subversive, that then the, milit the Israeli military turned around into um, yeah, this, this going through walls and this bombing and this alternative warfare that Nuran was describing. For me, that was really shocking to learn that. So the, uh, the very idea that the knowledge that, you, that one produces as an artist, an architect, an urbanist, an academic, that this knowledge can be turned around, abused, abused really, uh, for this kind of warfare, I thought it appalling. And so I understand very well that 
people uh, read the the small print in uh, in the, these conditions and 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 think about it but at the same time it means indeed that in fact um there is a kind of apartheid also in who is getting money for what you're right yeah but i just to add um to also to alessandra uh, they f they uh, the terror annex by the eu it's for individuals, as Alessandra mentioned, that you need to submit. We have one clown called Abu Sakha. He was taken to prison uh, seven years ago. Uh, then in this summer, he was taken again and probably will be released uh, in 10th of December or being postponed again for another two years as last time. We don't know. So beside the individual part, we have to sign against, we have three main political parties in Palestine, let's say, for the moment. Fatah, who leads West Bank, Hamas in Gaza, and PFLP. In this annex, we sign against the terror, uh, as they say, between brackets, political party groups, PFLP and Hamas. We have to agree that Hamas was elected democratically and transparently by the vision. Uh, all the EU countries were above the boxes. I was there personally. And Hamas won almost 68%, if I'm not mistaken, the elections. So it's democratically elected by Palestinians. Plus, the PFLP were also had sounds. That means as a cultural association or organizations, if we sign this terror annex that is released by the EU, where we live, means we sign against 70% of the Palestinian populations and we say they are terrorists. Are, could it be 70% of population terrorists? That's a question. Just to quickly reply on your last comment, it's very interesting what you say because uh, EU policies, especially in uh, conditional funding, usually treat uh, such uh, political factions as completely separate from people's everyday lives and their thoughts and their uh, compassions and their empathies and their uh, cause. So uh, it's, it's as if allegiance to a certain faction requires uh, some official m membership, whereas uh, really, um, uh, different uh, ideas and different, uh, um, uh, how do I say, it? support to different uh, uh, factions exists in multiple ways in the same household of every Palestinian family. Uh, and this is something I've always repeated from the, uh, the beginning of the recent uh, um, events. Uh, when people ask me which faction I support, you know how difficult that question is? You know how many arguments we have uh, per day at lunch on the dinner table just between one family? Now multiply that by every single Palestinian. It's a very complicated thing to think about. It's not political, it's social also. It's very social, it's cultural, and it's embedded in the everyday, in all the details. It's not just <laughs> this uh, headline on the news. It's much more complicated. And to expect a Palestinian to have a clear answer to that, I think is the uh, psychological warfare part of it, in fact. But to add to that, the conditional funding in uh, workplaces, um, I just want to add a comment on that. Uh, it also dictates and determines how Palestinian reaction looks like on the ground. In, in small details such as, uh, let's say there's a strike tomorrow, certain workplaces prohibit uh, um, the uh, participation of their employees in certain uh, demonstrations, even in West Bank uh, cities like Ramallah, let's say the most uh, quote-unquote liberal um, space. Uh, if you work for a foreign NGO, you are most likely not going to be allowed that uh, time off, even if it's a national strike uh, nationwide. Uh, a Facebook post is also prohibited at times. You could get in trouble at your workplace in Palestine, in the West Bank. Um, so this, we really underestimate how much uh, foreign funding determines not only the urban space of the, uh, the Palestine, it determines the, yeah, not the cyberspace, it determines the reaction, it d determines how the ground looks like but not to be very pessimist. 
uh, <laughs> <Please>. people <laughs> are fighting back. Yeah, even if you, it's yeah, yeah, it's not, yeah? yeah, exactly. People still manage to show up and still manage to, no one is pleased with this and no one is, everyone stands up to this. But it does exist. But even in Europe, I think I hear about many people who lost their jobs yes. for a post on LinkedIn or Facebook or just showing up in a, in a demonstration in, uh, at UK, in, in UK, in London. So with all this face recognition, the police yeah. called them back and they also withdrew, withdraw, withdrew uh, their scholarship and visa. And I think this is, this is for me shocking. It's about, if you are talking about freedom of choice, freedom of speech, and you are already taking sides, uh, being part of the oppression, oppressive tools. And of course, this also has to do with the neoliberal governance of, of the West Bank, uh, because it all, in my opinion, goes together. Um, another comment I wanted to make, because you mentioned Jerusalem, and uh, I say I'm from Jerusalem, uh, it's complicated, but yeah, I was born in Jerusalem. I can't access Jerusalem, I have a green ID. And uh, my uh, grandmother's house is in East Jerusalem, in Abu Dis. We have a bed and breakfast. So yearly, hundreds of tourists get to stay for quite cheap <laughs> in Jerusalem uh, to spend their vacation in Jerusalem. And uh, they get to exercise the privilege of free mobility uh, from our home in East Jerusalem. And yet, I can't. So that's a very surreal way of really coming to terms with what that means. Because, you know, we normalize it, the fact that I went to school in Jerusalem. I crossed the checkpoint every single day. It's embedded in my head as somewhat normal. It's, of course, not. Uh, so yeah, there's also that. And uh, speaking of tourism, this comes to my last, uh, not comment, a question. Um, when I think about tourist uh, lines, or if I look at the map and I uh, imagine lines, um, the, per the experience of uh, tourist mobility in Palestine uh, seems almost deliberate. Uh, so if I'm a tourist yeah. landing at Ben Gurion Airport okay. and I want to travel the north, for example, what I see in my periphery is almost, I feel like, deliberate. We have many tourists thousands of tourists that experience, quote unquote, Israel without citing Palestine. Exactly. Uh, from the architectural point of view, can you e expand on that? How is that possible? Yeah. Yeah. That is the best to do this. Um, I can, uh, yeah. I, there, there is a very, very um, ex example that is very, very telling to me. That is the example of the big museum uh, uh, of the Holocaust. It's done by a good architect. I forget his name. You're forgiven. Who is? Uh, no, it's not Liebeskind. I'm talking about the one in uh, in Israel itself. Uh, yeah, I think so, Shavdi. Um, uh, th that is that is really you're going in into a narrow space. You are the space is designed in such a way that you you encounter all these horrible things about uh, the, the sufferings of the Jews in the Second World War and, and all these very um, yeah, horrible like, um, things and memories and lists of names. And uh, uh, it's a very evocative um, space and a very evocative experience. The architecture is very well done, but de it's deliberately done in such a way that at the end of, of that whole trajectory, you enter a kind of balcony space and you have a magnificent view over the land of Israel. And it really, I could not escape. I think the narrative was so clear. The Jews went through all this suffering and at the end of the road, they have fortunately this land. The land of Israel is like the consolation prize for all the suffering they went through. So, but then the land of Israel presents itself to you as, yeah, this, this is now, this belongs to the Jews because it's what, what it's their right because after all this suffering. So it's, it's an architectural gesture that doesn't say that explicitly, but if you go through the museum, you cannot escape that, that conclusion here. Fortunately, the Jews have this land. 
Um, of course, it's completely ignoring the fact that the land was was not just theirs, or that that, that there were other people on the land that they drove away in, uh, in in 1948 and 1967. It's 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 completely ignoring that reality. But it's a narrative that for many many tourists in 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 uh, in Israel who are not, of course. Um, crossing uh, the wall and going into the West Bank, uh, let alone to Gaza. Uh, that's the kind of things they will visit and see. And, and that's, that's how they are also presented with the narrative that uh, Israel is a very um, progressive uh, country. It's very rich. It's, uh, it's the place to be. It's very Western. It's, uh, uh, it's very secure. No, uh, yeah, you don't see any Palestinians. You see a bit more military people than you would like, but uh, they are there to protect you. It's, um, uh, so it's, uh, but that's basically it. So the narrative is really Israel is one of the, um, uh, of the developed countries that uh, that are welcoming tourists and uh, that are um, yeah part of that European American uh, uh, cultural space, um, and that that in that way Israel is completely normalizing um, what it is doing. It's 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 presenting itself as a totally normal country that participates in Eurovision. That, uh, that has Erasmus exchanges and do I know what uh, uh, collaborations with EU and research collaborations and you name it. Um, whereas, uh, in fact, if, if you look at the reality of Gaza and the West Bank, that is unacceptable for, uh, for a country that presents itself as a democracy. I think it's totally unacceptable, but because it's normalizing this narrative of we are a very safe country where you have marvelous experiences as a tourist, and of course Jerusalem and, and other sites are incredible to visit. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's so one-sided, and, and that repulses me, really. If I, if I may add just a, 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 small, uh, a small thing on this, uh, as Hilda has, has, has uh, opened the, the, the ground very well, I, uh, uh, somehow this kind of narrative that we are like the West, we are kind of outpost of the West, and therefore we are tidy and secure, is really an, a heritage of colonial way of thinking that is deeply racially embedded as like just tra t take this kind of th this sentence and flip the coin on the other side of the coin you have which means that arab places are not secure places of the arabs are not secure and not tidy so which which what is this assumption would you say that for example japanese places are not secure and are not tidy. So it's just that there is a kind of a narrative that there is a kind of obscure community, the Arabs, but also if we if we broaden a little bit, I would assume also I, I can say it, the Africans are kind of messy and it's not secure and it's scary and it's not advanced. So you can you read uh, read through um, the the racist undertone that we are kind of used to and we feel at home with. I'm saying it as, as a European that moved to, I said, the other side, also the other side of the wall physically. Okay. But I wanted to, to suggest uh, about uh, the, the, the issue of uh, tourism and how uh, uh, the Israeli narrative is investing on tourism uh, to build its own narrative and it's investing consistently in a very systematic, there is a broad literature on this coming from tourism studies. Uh, I would suggest, for example, a very extensive work of Professor um, uh, Rami Isaac that is teaching uh, in, in HTV in, uh, in Breda, who has written a lot on this and uh, uh, Freya Higgins, this biologist, they have written a lot. It's less specialized because it's not, uh, it's not an, from an architectural perspective, but really builds, gives uh, so many information about this. Yes, indeed. Okay, 
We are finished. Uh, but I mean, only one comment to Hilda. <laughs> Language matters, words matter. When you say ignored, they didn't ignore. It is very deliberate, the way they design things. And it is systematic. If you go to any location of a destroyed village in the 19, from the 1948, how they transformed the whole history to be representing the biblical history, the landscape, everything is transformed to support this narrative. So it is all deliberate. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the lecture and uh, for sharing your insights uh, all the way from uh, Nablus.